Well, good morning. Let me invite you to turn with me in your copy of God's Word to our sermon text this morning, which is Lamentations chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. Lamentations chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. You could pull that up on your phone, or you could look on with someone who's sitting next to you, or you may find a Black Pew Bible underneath a chair in front of you. Perhaps they're spread around as you find that text. That will be good so that we can all have our hearts and our eyes and our ears on the Word of God this morning. Uh, In our church, we believe that the Word of God is of utmost importance because we believe that God has spoken to us by giving us the Bible, and in doing so, He has revealed Himself to us. He has revealed to us who we are. He has revealed to us our greatest need, which is forgiveness of our sin and restoration by His grace, and He has revealed to us the good news of the gospel And that good news is that Jesus came into the world to live a perfect life in our place and then to die on the cross in our place so that three days later when he rose from the dead, he could welcome sinners like us from all over the world into his kingdom to know him and to become like him and to enjoy him forevermore. And that news of the gospel is what has brought our church together. In fact, This is kind of an exciting, I don't know, it's exciting for me. I don't know how exciting it is for you. This is actually the 500th time that I have preached in our church. Our church is, uh, you know, we started um, just a little over 4,000 days ago in 2013 at the beginning of February. And so we're kind of celebrating this month a new birthday of our church being um, about 11 years old. And that's a big deal for me. Like, those who know me, I don't stick to anything. So the fact that I did anything 500 times, let alone something really hard like this, is, is really something. So this is, uh, it's exciting to see the things that God is continuing to do in our church and the way that he is growing us and strengthening us as he has been from the beginning. And even as we are walking through this difficult book of the Bible called Lamentations, This morning, as we consider the bite of sin, I want you to think about a question. Imagine that you had a chance to become a vampire. Would you do it? Now, I got in trouble once for referencing the movie Titanic. I got in trouble another time for making a lighthearted joke in a sermon introduction about Harry Potter, and I can't imagine what's gonna happen We're talking about vampires. So let me just say from the start, it is not an endorsement of a movie. It's not an endorsement of a book. And it's certainly not an endorsement of vampires for me to ask you this question. But just, I'm trying to help you expand your imagination a little bit as we think about the effect of sin in our lives and the great need that we have for God's grace, which he gives to us in the person and work of Jesus. If you had a chance to become a vampire, would you do it? With just one magical bite, you could have superpowers. You could live a life of power and control. You would gain all kinds of new skills. You could fly around at night. Would you do it? You would never have to look at your reflection in the mirror again. That's appealing to someone like me. Would you do it? Well, I want you to think about that because if you reverse the question, if you reverse the scenario, it poses to us another very important question. What if instead of becoming super powerful or superhuman or immortal or gaining these skills, what if by sticking your neck out and putting it on the line with one magical bite, you could lose all of that? That you would become incredibly mortal that it would steal away your power and control, would you do it? The reason I bring that to our minds is because that's exactly what we've done. That's exactly what I have done. And that's exactly what all of us continue to do every time we stick our neck out before the bite of sin. Now, that can sound like a cheesy thing to say, but it's true. This is what has happened to us. The Bible is clear that all of us are created to glorify God. We're created to glorify him, to know him, to enjoy him. 
But because of the fall of our first parents, Adam and Eve, all of us have been bitten by sin. And with that bite, all of the joy and hope and comfort of life, all of the goodness of life is lost. And this truth is clearly taught throughout the Bible. That's why we're coming again to this text to think about how important it is to understand what it means to be sinners. Throughout the book of Lamentations, as we've been seeing from the beginning, just for these first two chapters, we're seeing the results of sin and God's judgment on his people because of their disobedience. That's what it means ultimately to sin, to be in disobedience to God, to be separated from him. And the Bible is painting for us a clear picture of the tragedy of sin. Now, the reason that we want to understand this better is because it's on the backdrop of sin that we understand the good news of Jesus. It's only by seeing just how bad our situation is that we then turn to him for the grace that he offers to us. So we could do what many people in the world do and take all of the bad news of the Bible or all of the bad news of our lives and experiences and sweep them under the rug because we don't want to be bothered with all of that. But what we need to know is this. If we sweep that under the rug, if we take all of the dark or painful or judgmental kinds of things that we read in the Bible and we sweep them away, we will be sweeping away with them the good news of the gospel. Because there's no way for us to understand truly what Jesus has done for us until we understand our great need. And so this morning, we want to consider just two truths, I figure. You know, spend 500 sermons now, we'll go easy and we'll have a two-point sermon. And we want to consider in these two points exactly what has been lost through the bite of sin. And I want you to see first that sin brings a loss of joy. If you think about sin as that, that bite of evil that has infected us with sin in our hearts and has taken away so much from us, I want you to see again that sin results in a loss of joy. Hopefully this resonates with many of us who were here not too long ago as we walked our way through the book of Philippians, which is actually the letter of joy in which the Apostle Paul highlights just how important and good it is for us to pursue our happiness in Christ, for Christ, because he is the only one who can satisfy our souls. Therefore, when we come to this text and we notice some of the things that happen as a result of sin, we find that there is a loss of joy because sin pulls us away from Christ. Sin uh, challenges our relationship or faith in him. Notice as we look at just verse 6 to begin with, it says, He has wrecked his temple as if it were merely a shack in a field, destroying his place of meeting. The Lord has abolished appointed festivals and Sabbaths in Zion. He has despised king and priest in his fierce anger. We find here in this text what we've been seeing, and that is that the result of sin is destruction under God's judgment. And here, if you pick out some of those key words, you, you get a sense of many things, but in particular, the loss of joy for people who have been bitten by sin like us, or those of us who continue to be bitten as we stick our necks out over and over and over again. There's a clear warning here for all of us to take seriously our lives, the way that we live, and the way that we pursue God rather than sin, to pursue God rather than the world. Notice some of these key words. They'll come up again later in the text. He has wrecked his temple, the place of meeting, of gathering together, which certainly for God's people is a place of joy. It says at the end of verse 6, the Lord has abolished or done away with these festivals and Sabbaths. All of this carrying a certain kind of, 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 of theme of joy and happiness, that this is part of what is lost. It's a reminder to us, again, that sin is a thief. And it's a thief of something that is at the heart of the Christian life, and that is ultimate joy in Christ. Listen to what James 1, 14 and 15 says from the New Testament, making this even more clear. 
It says each person is tempted when he's drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. That's sin living in us. But then it says, then after desire is conceived, that desire grows up, it gives birth to sin, and then when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. This is a striking and central truth of the Bible. Sin brings death. Everywhere that it goes, it aims to destroy and kill and steal away. Here we see, and in many places in the Bible, the way it steals away the joy that is offered to us in Christ. And it steals away so much more. I think it's really important for us to think about sin this way. Sin is deceptive. It's deceitful. Sin, if you personify it like it's a person, is a person that doesn't want you to think about him or her this way. Sin would like to fly under the radar. Sin would, would like us to, to think that it's, it's okay to stick our neck out every once in a while and allow just a little bite of sin. Sin wants us to think that if we just dabble just a little with it, if we just let it have a little place in our lives, perhaps we have those little pet sins, that everything will be okay. But the reminder here this morning and throughout the Bible is that sin brings death. Many of you probably were shocked by one of those times that happens every now and then where sin seems to slip up and become out in the open a clear uh, representation or a clear picture of exactly what sin does. This week, my heart and my mind were captivated so much by many of you will remember our good friend, Pammy May and what happened this week in the tragic story about Darnell Taylor, the little five-year-old boy that she was fostering. And that so caught my attention because sin came out in the open. And sin could be seen for what it is, a murderer, a thief. To think that that Darnell will never know the joy of graduating high school or attending college or learning a trade, will never know the joy of his own wedding day or, or, or his own children being born because sin has stolen that away. Sin is our great enemy and therefore we do not want to underestimate the seriousness the deadliness of sin. You probably don't think about sin like that. And I don't either. On a regular basis, you don't think about sin that way. Because sin is hiding in the shadows. It's hiding within our hearts. It's, it's deceiving us. It's pulling the curtain down uh, over our, our eyes. And therefore, we need to see again and again the clear warnings of Scripture as we see here that sin kills and steals. Sin will make you unhappy in the greatest of ways. Sin will steal what your heart should love and treasure most. Sin will steal your ability to glorify God. We were reminded recently, especially again in that book of Philippians, what the, the highest aim of every person's life should be. And the answer to the question of what's the, the chief end or purpose of your life is simply this, to glorify God by enjoying him forever. This is exactly what sin wants to stop. This is what sin wants to steal away, is ultimately the glory that God deserves and the gladness that comes to us through him. Notice what it says in verse 10 as this continues, verse 10 and 11. The same kind of language is being used to paint the picture of sin's deadliness and the pain and loss that comes through the bite of sin. It says in verse 10, the elders of daughter Zion sit on the ground in silence. They've thrown dust on their heads and put on sackcloth. The young women of Jerusalem have bowed their heads to the ground my eyes are worn out from weeping. I'm churning within. My heart is poured out in grief because of the destruction of my dear people. 
because infants and nursing babies faint in the streets of the city. All of this is presented to us in Scripture so that we might come to hate sin. So I would ask that question this morning of all of us and even myself. Do you hate sin? How much do you hate sin? And what do you do when you find it? What do you do when you meet someone else who is struggling with sin the way that you know you do? What do you do when someone else has sinned against you or harmed you? What do you do in your hatred of sin? Do you hate sin enough to punish it with the law? If you do, that's good. Because sin should be punished. It should be dealt that way. But it's not enough. And that's not the ultimate expression of hatred of sin. Do you hate sin enough to pursue it with grace? If you weren't here this morning for the ABF hour just before this, as we've been thinking about the way that Scripture speaks into every area of our life, you missed such a clear opportunity to think through how we respond to sin's influence in the world. And the clear conclusion that we've come to that as Christians, this is what we do. We take the gospel and we pursue these expressions of sin with grace. We try to bring grace to people who are in the greatest need. We are not as God's people because Jesus is not this kind of savior, the kind of people that shun every toxic person in our life. We're not the kind of people that, that just push away anyone that we don't like or we don't like the way that they're acting, but we do quite the opposite. We do what Jesus has done. We pursue. We do that imperfectly. We fail. Many of us in this room have examples where someone has failed to pursue us and it stings and it hurts, but again, it's another one of those ways that sin has infected us. Nevertheless, we want to be the kind of people that, like Jesus, are in pursuit with grace. I believe that that's why the book of Lamentations exists. I believe it's why all of God's judgment exists. It is ultimately part of God's redemptive plan to bring people to the end of themselves so that they will come to him as the ultimate source of their satisfaction and joy, that they might have their joy restored, and that's because grace is in pursuit of sinners like me. So because of that, what will we do with our friend Pammy? Will we leave her in her prison? Will we leave her there all by herself? Despite all of the things that she's done, you know what we'll do? We'll try to take the gospel to her. We'll try to take grace to her because that's what Jesus has done for us. But it must begin with a hatred of sin. We must first make enemies with sin and to become such enemies that we are willing to root it out and to root it out with grace. Because what we see over and over again in scripture is that the good news of Jesus, the gospel, overturns the effects of sin, overturns the curse of sin. But this morning, I also want to see in this text that sin brings a loss of sanctity. It brings a loss of joy, but it also brings a loss of sanctity, a loss of the enjoyment of holiness, of being set apart, of the very thing that Christ has, has lived and died and risen again to do for us, to set him apart from the world as the clear redeemer of mankind and to invite us to join him and to be on his side, to be in his covenant family. Notice what it says in verse seven. The Lord has rejected his altar repudiated his sanctuary. He's handed the walls of her palaces over to the enemy. They've raised a shout in the house of the Lord as on the day of an appointed festival. If you look at this verse and you pick out those key words, you see them running together. They're words like altar and sanctuary and palace. An altar being the place of sacrifice, the, the place of atonement. Or sanctuary, the place of worship and gathering. Or, or the palace, a, a place of, of celebration, but also of gathering together, a place of belonging. But here, because of sin, judgment has come and has taken all of that away. Sin has resulted in a loss of this sanctity. Sin has, make it, has made every person 
like a broken down house. This is an image that an author named Paul Tripp has used in his book, Broken Down House. And it's an image that scripture continues to show us that sin has broken down everything about our world, everything about our lives. And therefore, when you look in the mirror and you see yourself, you can see yourself in the pages of scripture as a broken down house. That you have lost what is most central. Here, even among these people, they have lost what was most central and most hoped in. Listen to what Paul Tripp says in one part of his book, Broken Down House. He says, the world you live in is a lot like that broken down house. Every single room has been dirtied and damaged by sin. Not one part of it shines with anything like the pure glory that was so evident when it was first made. Sin has left this world in a sorry condition. I really felt that this week. That all of our lives have been treated this way by sin is a tragedy and nevertheless, it causes us all the more to consider the gospel. Listen also to these verses from the text this morning, verses eight and nine, and hear the way it continues to talk about the destruction that has resulted because of the sin of the people. The Lord determined to destroy the wall of daughter Zion He stretched out a measuring line and did not restrain himself from destroying. He made the ramparts and walls grieve. Together they waste away. Zion's gates have fallen to the ground. He's destroyed and shattered the bars on her gates. Her king and her leaders live among the nations. Instruction is no more, and even her prophets receive no vision from the Lord." What this experience and what this text brings to us over and over again, as does most of the Bible, is a question of two ways to live. That either we live in light of the grace of Christ or we live in light of the sin of our hearts. And we want to be clear about the deadliness of sin and the thief that sin is. Therefore, that we would go to Christ and we would keep our hearts close to him. That he would be the one that we're looking to for all of our purpose and all of our hope in this life. I noticed at a preschool recently, one of the little crafts that they had done was to write down different things that they had promised. And I noticed that all of the promises were things that they were going to do to make sure that everything worked out in the world. I promise to be a good friend. I promise to play nice. I promise to be kind. One little kid, Jorge, I promise to have fun. I like that one. All of those are good. All of those are good. But none of them can reach into the ultimate need that we have in Christ. And that ultimate need is not that we would be making promises to him or that we would make promises in the world, but rather that we would live within his promises to us, that we would find ourselves united to him. A logical question is, how do I become united to Jesus as the savior of my soul as the the lover of my life, the one who satisfies and cares for me? How do I move from someone who is a broken down house full of sin, who has lost and lost and lost through the bite of sin? And how can I become the kind of person who knows the joy of Christ? The Bible is clear that the way that happens is that as you hear the good news of Jesus and what he's done for you, that as your heart is being awakened to that truth, that you repent of your sin. That means that you turn away from your sin and you place all of your trust in him. It means that you let go of all of the things you would hope in doing, that you would be a good person, that you would keep promises, that you would be kind, that you would be a good friend. And rather you set all of those aside so that you may embrace what Jesus has done for you that you would become his follower. And that's a miraculous thing for the human heart that's been bitten by sin to change and to become a Christian. But it is necessary. It is necessary. And so our prayer every Sunday is that someone here, someone on the live stream will hear this good news and God will work in his or her heart and awaken them to the truth of the gospel so that they will become fully satisfied Christians in Christ belonging to him, finding their worth not in these other things, 
which is what happened to the people of God in the Old Testament. They were looking for their worth in other places and it resulted in judgment, but that they would look for their worth in him. Actually, if you can be patient for a moment here at the end of the message, there's a song and I want to share some lyrics with you. You'll see them on the screen. I I want you to meditate upon them because I think they capture so much the importance of, of understanding how the gospel changes our hearts and satisfies who we are and the longings that God has given to us. This is actually a song called, My Worth is Not in What I Own by Keith and Kristen Getty. Many of you will recognize that name as modern hymn writers. I want you to listen to these words and take them into your heart to meditate upon them. Maybe you could even look these lyrics up this week and spend some time thinking upon them as you think about this text of scripture more. This is what their song says. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul, and I will trust in him, no other. My soul is satisfied in him alone. As summer flowers, we fade and die. Fame, youth, and beauty hurry by, but life eternal calls to us at the cross. I will not boast in wealth or might or human wisdom's fleeting light, but I will boast in knowing Christ at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in him, no other. My soul is satisfied in him alone. Two wonders here that I confess, my worth and my unworthiness, my value fixed, my ransom paid at the cross. And I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in him no other. My soul is satisfied in him alone. And I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. And I will trust in him no other. My soul is satisfied in him alone. My soul is satisfied in him alone. I hope that those words resonate with your heart and and when you hear them, you say, yes, that's me, that's me. You may say it in these feeble words, you may say it as someone who is inconsistent, some days that's me, some days that's not, but I want it to be me. Well, praise God, because that is a work that only God can do in the heart of a sinner like me. Or it could be that as you hear those words, you know that's not you because that's not the kind of Christian that you are. That's not the kind of Christianity that you know. But perhaps God is working in your heart and he's building in you a desire so that you would say when you hear those words, I want that to be me. I want to know a life like that. Well, you can. And you can by trusting in Christ, by repenting of your sin and placing your faith in him so that you belong to him and he becomes your king that you will follow and depend upon him to do exactly what this song says, to satisfy your soul in him alone. This morning as we've considered this text, the first application was that we need to become enemies of sin that only happens because God's grace is at work in our hearts. But it's not enough to simply be enemies of sin. We must align our hearts with someone And of course, this text and every text in the Bible says, align your heart with Christ. Seek your satisfaction in him alone. Or as it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Is Christ Lord in your heart this morning? If he's not, I want him to be. I pray he will be. If you need to come to Christ, we want to talk with you more about that. We hope that you'll keep coming to church or let one of the pastors or someone else nearby you know so that we can spend some time together. We could pray together. We could talk about the Bible. We could talk more about the gospel. We want to continue pursuing one another with grace so that we'll be comforted and encouraged and find our satisfaction in him, but also so that others can hear of the hope that we have because Christ is sanctified as Lord in our hearts. I want to invite you to stand with me now as you're able, as we prepare our hearts to sing again. And I want you to think as we pray and even as we sing 
about the important truth of the gospel, which overturns the effect of sin. All that is lost can be regained by faith in Christ. And I hope that you will make this a matter of prayer and a matter of prayer in your heart as you sing. And that from here, God will continue to work in you and continue to work in all of us in these important ways. Our Father in heaven, we come to you this morning thinking about the tragic bite of sin, which has taken away so much from us, so much from our world. And yet on the backdrop of sin, we see the gospel shining most clearly. We pray this morning that you would use your good news in our lives fresh and new again today, fresh and new again this week and in every day to come. We pray that whoever is here or on the live stream or even friends that we know at home or in our neighborhoods, our schools, where we work, that you would give us courage, that you would give us confidence in the good news, and that you would make us true enemies of sin. And that our hatred of sin would be known by our pursuit of one another, of other people out in those places, with the gospel, with grace, so that they may know the truth, that you satisfy our hearts and no one else can. We pray that you would do this in us and that it would glorify you to do it. We know that, you, that it would. And so we pray for your work. We pray for your help and your change to come today in us and tomorrow in them. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.